Introduction to Evolutionary Psychology, Natural and Sexual Selection, Professor Michael Botwin, Department of Psychology, California State University, Fresno. Alfred Russell Wallace sent Charles Darwin a six-page letter from Malaysia. It outlined the notion of natural selection, the one that he'd been working on for 20-some years prior to that. It spurred on Darwin and his colleagues to get the idea of natural selection and evolution out there. Now natural selection is something I'm sure that you've heard of before and you've talked about at length. It basically has to do with adapting to the features of the environment an individual organism is in at any moment. Now, later, Darwin speculated on a second form of selection, which he dubbed sexual selection. He looked at the animal world and was puzzled that there were some characteristics that it had that did not fit in to adapting into the natural environment. Rather, these mechanisms helped animals in the mating game. In fact, the majority of the evolutionary psychology class and a great part of the personality class will cover the notions of sexual selection in humans and other animals. So, in this brief video, we're going to very quickly outline natural selection. Then I'm going to give you a couple of my favorite examples of sexual selection in animals. In succeeding units, we'll spend entire chapters talking about sexual selection preferences of both the male and female of our species. Now, bear with me. I'm going to give you some double entendres. There are going to be cute, salacious, slightly naughty, but that's what you get when you take a class with me. So let's talk a little bit first about natural selection. Well, let's start with natural selection. I have the biology online standard definition of natural selection for you, and I'll let you read this on your own. But basically, to recap it, individuals who adapt better to the environment tend to leave more offspring in that environment and will transmit those characteristics that are adaptive to their offspring. Standard evolutionary stuff, natural selection. Now, let's look at this guy here and this very horny guy. I told you the double entendres were coming. I didn't say they were very good, I just said they were coming. It's a now extinct member of the deer family misidentified as the Irish elk. Now you can see that the male Irish elk were extremely well endowed with huge racks. In fact, it's not uncommon for Irish elk racks to extend 12 to 14 feet in length. The amazing thing about the Irish elk is that it shed and regrew these antlers annually. So think about the massive amount of meta metabolic effort, excuse me, required to produce these antlers yearly. So there had to be a good reason for having such huge antlers. Let's rule out a couple of things. Biometricians who study muscle movement and skeletal movement, examined the male Irish elk and found that these horns, not great for fighting. They're actually antlers, not horns. The torque that would be generated from spinning around these antlers in a fight would result in the animal breaking its own neck. Now this looks really, really intimidating. So I imagine it might frighten off a pack of wolves but I don't think it would be very adaptive to 
be running through a forest trying to get away from a pack of wolves with 14 feet of antlers on your head. I'm always amazed at the Irish elk and the just huge antlers that it has. Let me show you another couple of examples. This is from a museum and you have three men holding one set of antlers so you can get some scale here. Here is another Irish elk from another museum. This picture here comes from a museum in Ireland and it was on one of my favorite blogs, Jerry Coyne's Why Evolution is True blog site when he's talked about the Irish elk. And it's the only picture that shows both a male and female Irish elk. The Irish elk lived naturally in Ireland, but through Northern Europe into Siberia. In fact, the first picture you saw was a picture from a field museum in Siberia. So what made the male Irish elk so horny? Sorry, they just keep coming. Basically, it has to do with sexual selection. Female Irish elk thought male Irish elk who were well hung with huge racks of antlers were sexier than those guys who had puny racks. So they favored them in mating. They did not mate monogamously, so the guy with the largest rack got the most mating opportunities. The rack of that antler excuse me, the, ant the male's antlers eventually got so big that they became maladaptive to the environment. This is a case of what Darwin called sexual selection. Sexual selection is often seen as a subcategory of natural selection, although sometimes it might work in opposition to natural selection, as is the case with our friend, the Irish Alp. My One of my colleagues, at Fresno State in the biology department. Dr. Fred Schreiber gave me this cartoon after he saw uh, the first part of this presentation. So here is an alternate version of why the Irish elk became extinct. I'll let you place your judgment on that one. So again from biology online, here is a formal definition of sexual selection. It's a form of natural selection in which, according to Darwin's theory, the male or female is attracted to certain characteristics, form, color, behavior, in the opposite sex. Thus, modifications of a special nature are brought about in the species. In other words, you find that you get an advantage, but a different kind of advantage with sexual selection. It's fundamentally different in ways from natural selection because sexual selection leads to an individual gaining a reproductive advantage over the other members of their sex. So those male Irish elk with the extremely large antlers had a reproductive advantage over those males who had extremely small rack. There are two subcategories of sexual selection. Let's talk about those. And the first one is intrasexual selection. This is competition for mates between members of the same sex for members of the opposite sex. In the case of the Irish elk and many other animals, they meet on a mating ground called a lek, L-E-K. The lek uh, is just a place where the animals gather and mate. But typically, the males show up on the lek a bit early and fight it out for dominance. Then those extremely dominant males stay and mate with the females, and the other ones just kind of go away. In humans, we see this happening all the time. One of the main variables that women uh, compete on with other women is physical attractiveness. So you'll find that 
women will try to outcompete each other in the attractiveness game, even when there aren't any other males around. Let's look at a stereotypical all women's event like a baby shower. Now I know many of them include males now, but I'm thinking about the kind of traditional one in our culture. So you might get a wide range of women from young women to grandmas and great grandmas. When women get together for an event, they all dress up for each other, right? They want to look their best. So even grandma is competing with her 20 year old granddaughter at an unconscious level to be the most attractive woman in that gathering. Now, guys generally don't get dressed up for each other when they hang out. What do they do? Well, instead of doing uh, dressing up, guys typically get together and they will do things like contest of strength and athleticism, bragging about who has the most money, who has the most resources, the nicest car, the nicest house, the nicest stereo, those kinds of things that males compete with each other on. Generally, status and resources are attractive to women. The guys that get on the top of that hierarchy usually secure the best mates. The other form of sexual selection is intersexual selection. This is the preferential choice members of one sex exert on the opposite sex. So, for example, female peahens, that's kind of redundant, sorry, will prefer a peacock with a large display of plumage. And in fact, uh, during mating season, the male peacock turns bright blue and gets his extremely large array of feathers, which can add three pounds to his weight. Now it's interesting to note that outside of mating season, male peacocks are just kind of brown dusty birds. As we will find out as we go along in this class, females usually are far choosier and selective than males. Darwin generally dubs intersexual selection as female choice. And the females evaluate the male for some characteristic. Uh, in the case of the Irish elk, it was the antler span. In the case of the peacocks, here's a picture of a female peacock and a male peacock. And you can see he's strutting his stuff, trying to show off to her that he is the most fit male with the best genes because he's able to show off so well at the mating game. As we go through this class, we'll come up with many, many different examples of intersexual selection variables in both humans and other animals. And in fact, you can look on the web and you'll find that it's typically the male that's brightly colored in most other species than ours. They typically do dances, have mating calls, do all of these things to try to outcompete the other males and draw the attention of females for mating. I uh, found this picture after watching a nature show. Here's, believe it or not, a peacock spider. This is not painted on. It looks kind of a little like it could be painted on, but it's not. The Maritis volans, or peacock spider. Male brightly decorated, female kind of brown and plain. Men will compete with each other intrasexually, as will women, but both will try to attract the opposite sex through characteristics that the opposite sex finds attractive in a mate, which is going to be a major chunk of what we talk about in our remaining time talking about evolutionary psychology. We will see you next time on Evolutionary Psychology. Bye now.
Couches Video Production, Copyright 2020, Professor Michael Gauntlin, All Rights Reserved.